Um, my name is Paula Harrison and I'm uh, the coordinator at University Centre Telford. Welcome to this evening's lecture by Dr Gavin Ward from the University of Wolverhampton Sports Department. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. I know it's a lovely evening and it's very tempting to, to stay outside in the sunshine. So we do appreciate that you've come, come inside to join us. Um, as I said, I'm the coordinator at University Centre Telford and we're part of the University of Wolverhampton and we're based in the heart of Telford in Shropshire. Um, and we normally have a public lecture programme which is held in the centre. Uh, but obviously because of the current pandemic, we have had to move our um, lectures online um, and the sports staff have been incredibly supportive and have offered six lectures and Gavin's um, lecture is the last of these six and they've been on a, a range of sports topics um, and have all been very well received. Now just before I hand over to um, Gavin I just wanted to explain that there'll be a, um, an opportunity at the end of the lecture for some Q and A, um, and for those of you who've attended before, um, the button for the Q and A, if you're on a um, desktop, is at the bottom of the um, screen, and if you're on a um, mobile device, it's in the top right-hand corner. Um, so we're delighted to welcome Dr. Gavin Ward for his lecture tonight, um, and the theme is compulsory exercise in school pupil and teacher eye views um, and some of our recordings from our previous lectures I've forgotten to say are also available on the University Centre Telford YouTube channel. So Gavin is a senior lecturer in PE at the University of Wolverhampton um, he leads the sports cultures and pedagogy research team within the Institute of Sport and Human Sciences. His research interests and recent publications cover uh, physical education, pedagogy, knowledge construction and socio-cultural investigations in health. So we say a warm welcome to Gavin and I'll hand over to him now. Thank you very much Gavin. Thanks Paula. Paula I can't seem to see anybody who's in the meeting here at all. Is that, is, can that be changed at all? Um, no there they're just sort of silently sitting, sitting. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> yes. All right, so I don't really know who I'm talking to. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a start anyway. Um, then hopefully some questions will come through and we can have some 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 discussion and conversation. Um, so yes, I reiterate, thank you for joining me on this lovely evening um, and coming inside to listen to me draw on about compulsory exercise. Um, so, in particular, I'm going to look at the Daily Mile Challenge and teacher and people perspectives of this exercise intervention. Um, and I'm going to draw in from research that I published in a peer review um, journal. So that means it's been uh, blind reviewed by uh, experts in the field um, and published in a, in a journal called Sport Education Society. And I published this with a, a colleague, um, Dr. David Scott, who's now up in Edinburgh. Oh, I've just clicked on the, oh, stop that. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry. Oh, well, we're in here. Sorry about that. Okay, can you, can you see that okay, Paula? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna go back. I need to go back to this slide here. Okay, so when we, um, uh, starts seeing uh, compulsory exercise in school, there are a number of or two key logical arguments that appear um, and they seem to be logical and they seem to be quite simple and the connection seems to be quite clear. And essentially it's that we have children doing um, less exercise, spending more time on screens, um, eating more food, that this is a national problem and as a consequence we get overweight children and at worst children suffering from obesity. And when we have children who are at risk or who do have, um, who are suffering obesity or who are overweight, the argument is if we burn the calories through an exercise intervention, they're either going to, so either going to solve the issue or 
in later life they won't necessarily suffer from obesity or this risk or the risk will be lowered and this is where my interest in compulsory exercise in school comes in and, and interventions like the daily mile challenge come in um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take us on a, on, a, on a critical now in terms of academic work when critical we don't just slam anything what we do is we we question and we question the assumptions behind arguments and we question the connections between those arguments and I'm looking at a critical position on the daily mile challenge which is a form of compulsory exercise and this sort of research I did uh, I wanted to consider how compulsory exercise is experienced by pupils and of course the teachers who are the um, subjects of these whole school interventions and in doing so I wanted to consider a, maybe a different position on physical activity and its role in health and well-being. Now we'll be questioning these logical arguments and, and for some of you it might be quite controversial and the argument is that child obesity is a national issue that physical activities will burn the calories and thus the solution is all for all pupils to do more exercise in school. Now I'm not suggesting that child obesity doesn't exist and I'm not suggesting that physical activity burns calories and I'm not suggesting that um, physical activity doesn't play a role in, in, in health and well-being but I'm trying to unpick this common held belief that not necessarily is proved in science. So when we start talking about um, physical activity, sport and exercise and physical education in primary school, we start to conflate, and that means we merge together and we see them as the same thing, these, these categories of, of physical um, activities. So physical education is, becomes the same as physical activity, which becomes the same as sport, which becomes the same as exercise. And we often see this conflation in the beliefs that people profess when they're involved in the teaching of the subject, often in policy and, and particularly in practice. Now for me, I'm a physical educationist. I've, I've been a physical educationist all of my career um, and they are different movement cultures or ways of, or, or, of and reasons for people give to engage in, in movement, okay? And the differences can be identified through the rationales that are provided for children to being tasked to do them. And, and the context in which they occur, and also the suggested outcomes um, of these interventions. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, something can be called, or sorry, it does mean that something can be called physical education uh, in name, but actually something else is actually happening when, when we examine it further. So as an example of this, we've seen um, Joe Wicks has, has uh, been broadcasting on through YouTube and has been titled The Nation's P Teacher. And it's an example of, of this conflation where we get a very specific form of exercise um, and we then have to question what's the educational value here. So how is this unlocking human growth for, for children? How is offering a different possession on, on exercise? How sustainable is it when we see just copying and sometimes uh, there's no means to gauge how well children are copying something so there's very little uh, connection with, with quality. And also we have to question particularly the self-interest of, of such interventions because of course this person's a businessman and makes money out of his broadcasts but not necessarily these but others. And so we have to think carefully about conflating the things, these things together. So for me, trying to find exactly the dividing line for them is, is, is not very fruitful, but we can see where they overlap and where we see difference, we can sort of work out what they are. So as an example, in physical education, we pupils might create their own forms of exercise to understand what they enjoy about participating in different forms of physical activity. So the educational element here is this empowering students to take, to bring what they know, to experience what other people know, and then to take a position on that. And that creates human growth because it creates a reflection upon your own and others' enjoyment or takes on physical activity. Another example would be in physical education, pupils might explore the movement culture of rugby. So this is a specialized sport 
okay? And in that examination, that specialized support, they might, for example, look at the relations between the rules and tactical solutions as, as an educational content, or they might look at the physicality of the game and examine ways to create inclusion between children who want that physicality and children who don't. And I think the key thing that for me that, that uh, makes physical education stand out in these respects is every child has to do it. And that in other contexts, that physical activity take, the sport take, the exercise take, they're not necessarily compulsory. So when we're teaching a subject, we have to realise children have to be there. And there, have, and there also has to be an educational content of it. We also need to question uh, bodies of experts who, who uh, thrive off or live off this notion of an obesity epidemic. And often, who often uh, provide solutions, but necessarily these problems and solutions aren't established in science and there's no direct link between cause and solutions. Um, and that we have a market economy, particularly now in education, and this creates opportunities for us to profit from offering these solutions. Um, and, and by um, subcontracting a problem onto somebody else, um, we can focus on other things, but we have to be really careful about the rationale for that sub subcontraction of, of, of um, physical education and exercise. So when we look at uh, some of the arguments and practice behind, behind um, exercise interventions and behind physical education, we really need to question the, clearly the rationale, we need to look at the evidence that supports that rationale, and we also really need to explore the outcomes or the experience offered beyond what might seem to be often self-fulfilling evidence to support continuation, such as they enjoyed it, it was great fun, everyone's happy, let's, let's do it again. We need to cut through some of this rhetoric about uh, assumptions around problems and solutions. And for me, this means exploring meanings, exploring experiences, and what this says about the interventions for those people who are required to do them. So let's go on to Daily Mile Challenge. Uh, some, some background, um, it it's, uh, originated in around 2012 uh, from a school in, in Stirling in Scotland, a primary school. Uh, the head teacher at the time was um, responding to, um, I think it was a comment made by a, a, a grandparent picking up one of their grandchildren who said that the children looked unfit. Um, the head teacher then acted on this and thought, you know, I'm going to create a space in a school day where children can exercise. It's 15 minutes. Um, and the children were encouraged to move around a particular route around a school. And when they averaged out how far they managed to reach in the 15 minutes, it, it, it turned out to be about a mile. And so the daily mile was born. Um, it has a catchy title. Um, they ha they, it's got its own movement, so it's hosted by a, uh, a sport and physical activity um, agency. Um, and 50% of, of Scottish schools now claim to do the daily mile. Um, there are 8,500 schools registered on their, um, uh, in their community, and that covers about 150 different countries. So there's a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a strong movement behind this, and it seems to have taken off. On the website, the messages are very bold, they're very powerful, and there's lots of emotive use of language. Um, it's endorsed by politicians, it's endorsed by sports administrators and sports uh, celebrities. Um, and essentially, the arguments are obesity is a risk, and all children are vulnerable, and that every, every child is, a, is um, at risk of this, and therefore we need this emotive call to action and the solution is to run. Um, and essentially, there's a claim that it, it actually improves physical and mental well-being, um, it improves their fitness, and it closes the attainment gap, so between underprivileged and privileged children and their, their teacher assessments and SAT scores. So in order to understand this bold use of language, a very emotive use of language, we need to understand the discourses, the arguments that lie behind childhood obesity. And writers have been, have been writing about uh, and research around childhood obesity since the mid 1980s, and 35 years on, concern still remains. And this is perhaps now wrapped in, in concerns for, for children's mental health. 
And essentially the arguments are, are around the risk that uh, Western industrial lifestyles create for children. And this, I, this notion that we have uh, lots more food being eaten um, and in order to burn that food, we need to exercise. Now, this is a, a nice simple argument and we've seen simple arguments being used that, that kind of go over, that wash over a lot of the complexity that exists. So if we take austerity, for example, um, the coalition government liked, likened our, um, our economy to a household budget, which then if you think of a household budget, borrowing lots of money and uh, in relation to your income uh, and it exceeds your income is not a good idea. And so this gave the, the rationale for the argument for, for slashing public expenditure. Um, and no economist, they don't tend to agree with each other, but no economist would, would ever agree that uh, our complex economy is like a household budget, it's not. In the same way, this oversimplification of obesity and how to solve it means it, this argument comes transferred to everybody and everyone's at risk. And it, it, it means that we can have these powerful emotive demands for action without really looking at the complexities of what lie behind obesity. So obesity science is, is a term given by two writers who've written since 2005 in this area to studies that tend to look at exercise interventions, that look at uh, nutrition interventions around obesity. And there are two main studies um, that have been completed on the day in my challenge. One in Stirling, where, where it originated, and the other in Birmingham. And essentially, these studies take baseline measures such as skin fold calipers, uh, body mass index, so they have to measure height and weight, and, and physical fitness tests. And they compare this with the moderate to vigorous physical activity of the day in my challenge. Um, and they reported an increase in physical fitness and uh, a decrease in um, fat mass. And all the authors talk about the small scaleness of their research and to have caution, they don't play down the rhetoric that the DMA challenge is slow in costs, it's mass participation, it's cheap, it's easy, and therefore is a nationwide solution and should be used as justification for national policy around children's weight management and bridging attainment gaps. Now here we have a blurring of the distinction between evidence and policy, and Thorburn's recently just written about the Daily Mail Challenge in this particular issue. And we see a conflation of a localized disease with sweeping claims for national policy based on limited evidence. So the, the idea of this presentation is not to take on, on uh, uh, obesity science and, and analyze it. It's about looking at uh, children's and teachers' experience of, a, of an intervention, but we have to understand that obesity science is not neutral. Um, we've seen this in, in, in the reports now around some of the scientific reporting around COVID, where we've had uh, some, some scientists claiming that they they repeatedly argued that we were only two weeks behind the spread of the disease in Europe and other people were arguing four weeks and the two week people were, were silenced because of the political argument or the, the, um, the desire to delay us going to lockdown. Um, and essentially, BC science is similar. It's just, science is not neutral, it's political as well, particularly when we have the reporting of um, of results. And when I looked at uh, a lot of the literature, potential cause and risk change depending upon the research that is, use the basic approaches, whether it's nutrition, exercise, exercise, and nutrition, nutrition only. Um, and essentially, Garden Wright particularly argue that when we have a problem, we need to fix it. In order to fix it, we need funding, so that creates uh, an income stream for research. Um, and also policy uh, makers are wanting to show concern and fiscal concern for, for what might be national issues. And so we, we don't necessarily have this pure purity in uh, researching something and finding a solution. And when we examine childhood obesity and when I examine the literature around it, it's a real complex function of lived lives and it's not necessarily linked to an activity. Um, so what we have here is an area where there's lots of short-term interventions. There are long-term studies, but are lots of short-term interventions. 
um, and incomplete science is scientists don't necessarily agree on, on causes and solutions. That said, uh, exercise and whole squats, exercise interventions are, um, are popular and um, the Daymar challenge is one of many. Um, and these come from what, what we would term, we can term pathogenic approaches to health. In other words, they're about treating potential risks or, or pathogens that could, that could um, cause damage to the body. So this predominantly medicalized view of the body suggests we all need to treat it or need to minimize the risk to health. Now this can narrow uh, our view of the many other resources we draw from. So just looking at the body as a thing to be exercised um, and disciplined, we miss out the everyday health uh, that, that children have and the resource they draw from their friendships, uh, the work they do, the recreation they, they partake in, uh, the mental uh, skills and attributes they have. Um, and also a path pathogenic view of health can, can narrow our view on health being a, ut ut a utopian kind of objective. Um, and whether we have an illness or not, we all have a health, a health right now. Um, and we need to understand what health goes into making up that health. This doesn't mean I'm, I'm anti-medical. I mean, if I went <laughs> into hospital, I want to find a, someone who is a, an expert in, in a pathogenic approach to health. But when we apply these approaches in social health policy, what tends to happen is this narrowness tends to individualize responsibility on the person who's suffering from obesity or, or has poor health. Otherwise it's about their bad habits and their bad choices. And this produces bad bodies. And because particularly children can't be entrusted or parents can't be entrusted, we have to have a blanket enforcement of activity. And in essence, they don't get any decision making or agency in, in deciding sort of the shape and nature of the physical activity they do. So we have, a, we have an exercise intervention imposed upon them and their bodies. So you can probably guess here, what I'm trying to do is create this tension between complex live lives of health and narrow medicalized view of avoiding a uh, risk of illness disease. And, and in essence, running for 15 minutes is a very adult way of viewing the world. I mean, anyone who's, who, who runs or who's tried to do the couch to uh, 5K realizes that actually running is a quite a skillful discipline um, to try and get a training effect. Uh, so if, if, if you're fit and you run a lot, we need to use pacing as a skill to try and get a, a training effect. It, 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 it's, and this skill has to be learned. Um, you also have to have a long-term view of what you want to achieve. Um, you've got to be disciplined. And you have to learn mental tricks and, 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 and psychological ways of dealing with, with the uncomfortableness that running can, can cause. And, and essentially, they need to be taught. You can't just, just magic them from just doing exercise. So essentially, it's running is actually, if we're not teaching these things, it's, it's about putting adult long-term thinking and a view of the world on children for their best in the long term. Um, and essentially, when we come back to it, physical activity doesn't solve obesity. Um, it's normally used as a short circuit way to, to try and create a behavior change. And part of, of a means to try and reduce weight. Um, so for me, this really raises questions about the purpose and meaning associated with physical activity that children are encouraged to do, uh, uh, particularly in name of, of um, exercise interventions connected to health concerns or obesity. And, and when I examined the literature, there was so little research that actually took the views of the subjects of these interventions, the people seriously, they, the, the peoples were absent in the research. So I set out to try and to try and take their, these these people's uh, voices seriously. Um, and in social science, so you can't just go in and ask opinion and, and, and publish that because this can change. Uh, they may not actually be what they think and feel, etc. So um, what we try to do is we we explore meanings behind social processes and decisions and actions. And when we do this, it doesn't become opinion, but more reflection of the lives 
in relation to the social farm being explored. So in a sense, it was the, the, the reflection of their thoughts and feelings and actions around their compulsive participation in Daily Mile Challenge. Now, it was a real challenge for me uh, in order to find a position where I could take individual opinions and, and, and views of Daily Mile Challenge, but also see a commonality. Um, and often in, in theory, social theory, uh, we have individual theories or commonality theories. We very rarely bring the two together. So for an example, a psychology would be quite an individualized way of looking at, at, at an opinion or, or a view about something. Um, and so I needed to find a way in which um, these were mutually constituted together so I could explore them. So whilst a child might have children might have different experiences, there would also be a commonality of experience of, of the day in my challenge. So what I did is I turned to a social ecological framework. In this sense, it sounds confusing, but bear with me. In this sense, pupils both use their experience. So I bring my experience to a situation to help me have an experience, but also work within that experience. So work within what's happening in that experience to create new to create a new experience so in that sense people's become both produced by the experience but also producing of experience okay so they're, they're mutual now i turn to um a writer in education um called john dewey um he wrote around the 1900s um and he wrote a lot around the mutuality, so this connection between person, people, and environment, how our psychology is linked to our body, which is in turn linked to our environment, which is linked to other bodies and the physical environment as well. And for him, he argued that knowledge essentially is action. Um, whether, whether I'm reading a book, I'm involved in a social action. Um, or if I'm running around as part of the day my challenge, I'm involved in action. And it's the functional coordination of actions that permits our uh, situation or situation room to be intelligible. So when we see a flow of actions, something's intelligent, well, not intelligent, something's intelligible to the people doing it. Um, but when there's an interruption, this um, context becomes unintelligible. And in order then to build functional coordination, they, the the participants have to focus on ends in view. So what I did was to take observations and focus group interviews with both pupils and teacher, and I explored their ends in view with the functional coordination of actions. And in doing so, I, I argued, or sorry, we argued in the paper, that we could say something around about how teachers and importantly, pupils negotiate the daily mile challenge. So that explains the theoretical framework. So what I'm going to do now is show you how I applied that to, to the data. So my first challenge was to try and understand the commonality experience of the daily mile challenge, know what constituted, what was meant, were made up of. And I'm going to read to you very briefly from, from some observation notes, and this will help explain the slides to come but also we'll give you an idea of what this uh, looked like at the time of research this day in my challenge looked like at the time of research so the teacher starts a jog in little strides one way around a patch of grass most people's walk and some jog in the opposite direction there are no markings of space it is a patch of wet grass 50 meters by 40 meters the teacher stops to talk to the classroom assistant they then both walk around the opposite direction to the class they stop and watch the pupils. The teacher offers a well done to those who are jogging as she collects coats from children who are too warm. Some pupils jog about 20 meters, then walk, then jog. Most walk in groups of two or three. The circle of pupils make gets smaller and smaller. Some girls run in small bursts, punctuate by walking. As a teacher resumes walking, she calls purely, bury your speed, hands out of pockets, do a chicken. Some children pick up their pace and beat their others as wings. The classroom assistant acts as a stationary way marker. Go behind me, she instructs. Both adults direct the children to make a bigger circle because it's become very small. The teacher looks at her watch and walks back to the classroom, gradually class notice and follow her. So after initial um, uh, pilot of, of the Daily Mile Challenge by a couple of teachers in the school, 
it was rebranded as, as the name of the school run. And in essence, this enabled it to, to gain sort of malleability and it could fit in with the teachers' ends in view. Now, a number of the teachers talked about the importance of it to uh, create a break um, uh, between um, lessons and particularly in the afternoon. And some of the pupils talked about the uh, way in which some teachers use it to discipline the people. So as a, as a threat to say that they, they wouldn't go out if, if, um, if uh, they didn't listen, they wouldn't get to the day in my challenge. So essentially, the little definition of space, definition of distance, the speed, the start and the finish, um, it was quite clear that it wasn't classroom, because classroom is the opposite of that, and it certainly wasn't break time. So children talked about break time being a place where there are lots of negotiation and different directions that, that, that this functional coordination action could happen, and children could leave and come at their own, own time. So it was very different to that. Um, the, the pupils talked about was time to chat, time to get some fresh air, and as one one people said, time to wash your hand and get some light. So obviously very different to what's expected in your classroom. So I came to conclusion this is very much an indeterminate space for both the teachers and the pupils. Um, it was a space of not classroom, not break time, not running, and not a mile, where the when and where of the of the of where the negotiation, sorry, the when and where of, of, of the daily mark challenge goes to the teacher, and this is what constituted daily mark challenge, and the how is negotiating the pupils and teacher. Now, for the teachers, this is about promoting purpose, in other words, looking like the daily mark challenge. This is my first thing with my data, and the pupils are taking a moving break. And this is my second thing, and I'm just going to take you through these now. So, the teachers talked about this responsibility and perceived responsibility to respond to the, the arguments we've talked about um, children's health and risk of obesity and in order to fulfill this they had to keep the children moving um, and the children in some way had to respond to the teachers encouraging them to keep moving. Now uh, a number of, oh, sorry, all, all schools now, um, particularly in England, get uh, pupil premium funding for uh, physical education and school sport. Um, and this has uh, increased dramatically over the past couple of years with a sugar tax. And, and for the, the lead uh, teacher in this initiative, needing the day in my challenge to look like the day in my challenge was important to show they were taking the people premium funding seriously and doing some to protect the health of pupils. So this is the function of this. So I'm just gonna read you an excerpt of data here to explain that. All schools are thinking about it because the sugar tax money that's been put into schools, we've got to justify that we're using that sugar tax money and having impact. We have to find time and find, to find time that children are active for a minimum of 30 minutes a day. So you need to put something in place to ensure that is happening. And this gives you the extra 15 minutes a day. We have to go to show that we need this money as it's only been ring fenced for a certain amount of time. We need that to be extended. Yes, the day in my challenge is free. It's just another way that proves we're a school that cares about children's movement and physical activity. So we have a function of the day in my challenge to justify funding and to show, try and show that we're taking some of these arguments about children's health seriously. This is also reflecting what the child, people said. So this child said, you're not allowed to stop completely. Say if your lace is untied, you're not allowed to stop for ages. You have to keep going. You can walk, but then this is, well, like say three minute power run, and then we run a bit, and then you can like relax and walk. So for the pupils, they, what they talked about was taking this moving break away from the classroom. Um, and it was had to, had to feature as a break. So some of the teachers uh, did the day in my challenge at the end of lunchtime, and some of them really liked that because they got an extra 15 minutes, and also it helped them to, to refocus themselves and get back into an afternoon at school. And other pupils uh, liked it being done in the middle of the afternoon to help break up the afternoon. Um, but when it didn't feature as a break, we saw really that the Daily Mile didn't have this function and, and didn't want to do it. So as this, this, this child um, says, sometimes a teacher asks us just before home time if we want to do it, I don't like doing it then. So 
in order for it to be in total, it had to be a beer break. Now, the Dame Martone also features break from the classroom. It's quite important role that the children saw it had, um, as this this uh, year four or five focus group reported. We do it in the afternoon. In the morning, we are sort of refreshed from break time and all that. But in the afternoon, you get really tired. We come back in and sit down, and I get in and, in and, and concentrate a lot more. The people adds, you don't have to run and toss up. But when I come back, I feel relaxed. So here we have a function in helping them to break up a, a, a longer afternoon, but also to come back and return to their work and feel like they could come back to it and give it, give it more focus. Now children obviously bring their own experiences to, to activists. And this is an, an example of, of a pupil wanting to try and reenact pacing. Um, so he says, it's really tricky to do it non-stop. They, like the teachers said, it's not about going the fastest, but pacing sales and keeping going. I sometimes run, but it's jogging like I like I do with my mum and dad. Sometimes I sort of run the long bits and walk or jog the short bits. It like depends. Most people just walk, but I like to try and jog. I want to do athletics and be in a team, so I like to show my good running. So here we had a, this, this child trying to use what he knew about running to make it intelligible um, but still find that difficult um, and it's a child that's engaged with running outside school um, so the, the pacing obviously wasn't being taught at all and the, the, the skillfulness of this activity was just being expected of the pupils now with this notion that children were moving at different speeds some were running and jogging jogging the children tended to naturally move into pairs or threes um, very rarely on their own and it created this sort of inadvertent structure of sociability and it was that important that as this child says when that wasn't there it was quite a scary place and she said if you had a bad lunchtime there's no one to talk to walk with but when you do it you're all alone it's sad you need someone to talk to so we had this this creation of this inadvertent space of particular sociability so in my conclusions, um, I argue that when we explore the meanings generated from um, day in my change, we see different values attributed to it. Um, and for these children, it was about outside time with friends and a break from the classroom were really important health resources. So this day in my change was a really useful health resource to get outside, away from the classroom, and to be with friends and have, have, have a, a moving sociable break. And this is a break away from quite pressurised uh, classrooms with this inadvertent least structure with, with, with the time and space for them to, to, to actually connect with each other rather than the melee and um, complexity of, of break time. So a number of recommendations um, off the back of this research. So as you probably guessed from the, from the start, we need to really evaluate and consider knee-jerk reactions to common discourse about child obesity. And, and uh, doing compulsory exercise, such as a daily mole intervention, um, because the thing about risk of child obesity doesn't necessarily stack up. Um, and actually, if we, when I went to meet the children, they talked a lot about the different health. Um, and this research really showed some of the different health resources that pupils drew from for, to support these health. So they talked about their classroom house, they talked about their morning house, their afternoon house. Some of, some of us adults will recognize that too. Their playground house, their energetic house, their friendship house. And so all these health create resources from which they draw that create their sense of well-being. Um, and whilst often adults, and particularly in, with this, um, a lot of the discourses or arguments that are attached to exercise interventions, um, it's argued about physical health, about fitness and weight, and the children didn't talk at all about that. It was, it was not about that, but they talked about these other health that were really important to them. 
And in this instance, if, if we're going to make children do particular forms of exercise and, and, and such as this, we need to teach them the skills of it in order to create the, the key to unlock the door. So we need to teach them about how to pace. We need to teach them the, the, uh, the psychological skills. We need to teach them the, the skills of judging pace, maintaining pace, um, in order for it to become meaningful to them, intelligent to them as, as a physical activity with challenges and potential uh, fitness um, benefits. But really in this school, um, it's apparent that just permitting greater pupil voice and the type and form folks away from the classroom would have been an ideal opportunity for this to happen, to give some children some ownership about the sorts of things they like doing, they connect with, that they enjoy doing, that are phys physically active, that are sociable. Some of them might not be sociable, but to provide those those different ideas about what they enjoy doing as as physical activity away away and that's away from classroom work and and really this research for me has helped me understand that that, that there are a number of health resources that children draw from and that create their sense of well-being and it's researching those further and understanding therefore how we can try and strengthen those resources but also widen to give them a more robust um, basis. And that's what, what I'm, I'm going to do uh, in, in my next research project. Um, and that really concludes what I, what I have to say. And here's some extra reading that I, that I drew from for um, this presentation. And I would now welcome some, some questions from you. Okay, thank you very much, Gavin. That was really brilliant, very enlightening. Um, we haven't had any questions posted yet, so if anyone wants to have a think about the question now that Gavin is finished, um, Gavin would be delighted, I'm sure, to, to answer anything that you've got to ask. In the meantime, Gavin, can I just ask about um, the involvement in, of parents um, in exercise? Um, is, are there, is there any evidence that involving parents of primary school children in exercise like the Daily Mile would um, at all? That obviously, uh, like obesity and uh, so eating habits, exercise habits, start in families. Um, not so mean that families are to blame when children don't do exercise, but they're highly influential with, in, in children. Um, and uh, there is literature that kind of looks at this. This there are families being a, a useful way to to encourage children to take part in physical activity, um, but. What I'm trying to argue, I suppose, is, as you pointed to, another, <laughs> another social environment in which children eat and, 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 and exercise, and exercise um, that, you know, obesity, physical activity are highly connected to the environments that children live in, uh, the people that they live with, um, and what they're exposed to. Um, and often... <sighs> The say the oversimplification means we just then just say well chuck that at them and that that will do it that will make them fit to that that you know and other schools have done it it will work and and what I'm arguing really is we need to sort of stop doing that and look deeper at children's health you know a child with obesity has a health um, and we need to look at at, at children where they draw their resources from how can we strengthen them how can physical activity become part of those resources? How can physical activity grow some of those resources or, or add to the base and strengthen them? Um, because we often look through the world through adult eyes and our adult world is very much contained in different specialism, and different sciences and we separate things out. And, and it's not necessarily a lived world, which is a complex world. And, mm -hmm. and um, I've done some research um, uh, last year with my own students and their particular uh, experiences of doing gymnastics and dance in, in, in the lectures that we do in the modules on our course and what was what came forth was a really fascinating 
way in which uh, which students cope with the stress of of assessments. Um, and and I and I use the theoretical perspective there it was about lived experience, and this really happens a world into a view that you wouldn't necessarily find out by having conversations with people. And if you, you explore these, you realize how, how ha people have habits of dealing with things, how they view themselves and what they're capable of doing. And, and so this, in this complexity, we can, we can understand what we can do to support students. And, and this, this is what, what I found, how to support them um, as learners in, in our educational environment. Um, and so the same comes with trying to develop health. It's, it's, it's not looking at health as something that is just our physicality or absence of disease. Um, and often when we, when, we, when we ask questions about health, that's what people retreat to because that's often what we talk about. When you ask them about other things, about, about what makes them happy, what makes them feel good, uh, what they enjoy doing with their time, um, uh, about um, what makes them feel strong, what makes them feel wor of worth. This is where we start seeing more things that actually that are health, but we, we don't ask those questions. Mm. It's giving them a voice, isn't it? And listening to that voice that's important. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Everybody is very shy again tonight. No, no questions posed at the moment. Um, okay. Another minute or so. Um, check the chat as well. Oh, I've just got a question here. How are developed countries reacting to issue obesity and physical activities? Well. Uh, I'd say we're, we're a developed country and what, what we've tried to do is we've seen obesity as a disease that, that can be treated through physical activity and uh, the, the simplicity of looking at obesity like that uh, and there are a lot of research papers that have done exercise interventions, just diet interventions, exercise and diet interventions um, that have looked at different dosages of physical activity um, but the longevity of it, particularly with obese patients, what I've, what I've, what I've read and my understanding of it is that um, often weight goes back on and physical activity doesn't necessarily, adherence to physical activity doesn't necessarily continue. And it's a short term thing, but it can be used to try and short circuit behaviour. So it might improve people's sense of, of well-being by, by doing exercise, which mean they might think more about uh, the sorts of... Uh, food and uh, they're putting in their bodies um, uh, but it, it's not the, the, the sole rule um, and in relation to children it's often being done too <laughs> we do things to kids for their long-term benefit we we're not we often think about children as as uh, incomplete and actually they're that, that they are complete, they're, they're growing, they're becoming um, you know I saw some I went to um, pick up my children from school today uh, and I saw some children um, playing in, the, in a kind of a local park area and thought, oh, look at them, you know, no cares in the world. And you know, I've got all these things going on at work and all these things happening for us. And actually I had to stop myself and say, no, they do have cares of the world. Um, they do have concerns, they do have worries. They're just not overburdened by the our same worries and they don't have the, the huge responsibilities we have, but they still have responsibilities. They're, they're, they're becoming people, they're not absence of, of the way we live life. So as adults we forget that. And I think in terms of children, it's when we see them as becoming, we, we, we therefore then will, will, will respect their opinion and ask them and give them control over what they do, challenge them. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that sex as the daily mile is, is not useful. Um, it could be used, use a really useful tool to, to uh, people's examine the physical activity, you know, and, and why they, you know, about the challenge of continuous activity and that actually we don't need to run. <laughs> uh, we can just get as, as good, good exercise from and enjoy ourselves and talk to people and feel good about ourselves through walking. It's mm -hmm. this simplicity of a link between energy out and food in and we're going to burn the calories and that's the solution that's the kind of simplicity of the argument that, that, that I, I started with at the beginning it's not as simple as that there's a lot of other complex things that get in the way 
that, that produce uh, um, obesity. Okay, thank you, Gavin. That's done. Okay. Thank you for that question, by the way. Yes. <laughs> um, nothing else coming up at the moment. Okay. I think that might be might be all. Um, I wonder, Gavin, if people could have your email address. Certainly, uh, yes. So it's, it's very easy. It's Gavin, G A V I N, dot ward, W A R D. So that's Gavin dot ward. Um, and the address of the university is um, at WLV dot AC dot UK. That's at WLV dot AC dot UK. Um, and I'm more than happy to to engage in further discussions and, and support where, where necessary. Mm -hmm. So if people are from schools or colleges? Certainly, certainly, yeah, sure. That's brilliant. Sure. Okay, thank you. And just while you're still there, we've got um, a few more lectures coming up. Um, obviously, we've mentioned the six in sport, and I'm sure sports staff will do more lectures in the future. Uh, we've got um, a well-being and yoga session tomorrow evening which is on zoom and can be found on the university center telford website and facebook page um, and then next week for something completely different we've got um, a lecture on voodoo by one of the lecturers from the school of art and then coming up there's also a fake news lecture as well so obviously everybody is more than welcome to attend um, those lectures so um, just have one last look at the q a um, so there's nothing there so I think um, if we draw it to a close and oh. I'd like to say thank you ever so much Gavin um, thank you. Really, really interesting um, I've never thought of the day mile challenge in, in those terms always thought of it as just just good but I think um, that was really interesting to view it from those different points of view so thank you very much that was brilliant and thank you very much to all of those who joined us tonight yes. That's yeah, lovely. thank you too. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.